Yesterday out on the streets, we had a few folks heckling us a little bit. Had a professed homosexual. That's, at least that's what they told me. They said they don't believe in God, but they believe they, they're going to hell. <laughs> that's what he said. He said, there is no God. I don't believe in a God. And he said, I'm going to hell. Uh, you believe in hell and don't believe in God. Yeah. You know, I can't tell you how many times we've witnessed a true confession. Amen? Yeah. I'm not going to hell. Why? I can confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and that confession comes from within. I know that to be true. Amen? Like I was just saying there, you know, uh, saying that you trust Jesus, you ought to mean it, right? Right? You can confess that Jesus is Lord and it not be a true confession. Amen. You can believe in vain. You can say anything. You can say any word. You can say whatever you want. But a true confession comes from within. comes from the heart. And you know it to be true. So I don't know. We've seen that happen many, many, many times out there. You know, and it just strengthens my faith in the Word of God. That's one of the things being involved in a ministry of trying to get the Word of God out there. You know, take the Word of God out there. It strengthens your faith in the Word of God because you begin to see the Word of God in action. It will not return void, right? It accomplishes exactly what God would have to do when we put it out there, and we get to see that. We get to witness the Word of God at work. Amen? I remember preaching down in Pensacola out on the beach. That was a hoot. <laughs> it was crazy. They had to cut that thing off after a while. It just got too. It just got too bad. It was just too crazy. I mean, we were getting beer thrown on us and spitting, and you know, it got too crazy. But I tell you what, there's nothing like what I experienced there as far as spiritual warfare. It's just amazing. I mean, you got a bunch of folks just you know having a good time out on the beach. And then as, as soon as the preacher opens his mouth with the Word of God, it was like a tidal wave, man, like just this rush of... I mean, if there's no truth to that book, what's the big deal? Just ignore it. Just ignore it. I mean, you say you don't believe it anyways, and you don't believe in God, and it's all fairy tale. Well, then just ignore it. I mean, if I st stood out there and, and, and read Peter Pan... <laughs> right? Or recited Peter Pan or some fairy tale, they'd think you're crazy, but they wouldn't get mad at you. They wouldn't get hostile, would they? Right. I highly doubt it. Yeah. Right? But as soon as you start quoting that book, it, and we heard that yesterday. <laughs> That's what the guy said. Yeah. <laughs> that book is sharper it's powerful yes, sir. and it's sharper than any two-edged sword it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart yes, sir. Amen. and that doesn't just include those that are saved that includes everyone it Amen. cuts them deep yes, sir. they don't like the light they hate it they run from it they despise it and when you take the Word of God out into the world, and I know it's not a popular thing to be bold, but it strengthens your faith in the Word of God. It proves that book to be what it claims to be. It's a living book. It's a living, breathing book. And God uses that book in a mighty way. So, I mean, just another, you know, just another witness of the power of God's Word yesterday. I mean, I can't, I, I can't even recite all the times I've seen that. The book. I've forgotten a lot of things, I'm sure. You know, I, just, I just appreciate the Lord using us. Because He doesn't have to. He doesn't have to. It's a privilege. It's a privilege. You got that right. Yes, sir. We ought to look at it that way. What a privilege to be God's instrument, Amen. to be a vessel that's honorable to Him, to take His Word to this world. You know, in the Old Testament, that was just left to a few privileged men, prophets. Mm -hmm. right? 
And a few women, too. Just a few. God didn't choose, you know, like Elijah with those, the, the, there's one Elijah and you got how many prophets of Baal? Was it four or five hundred or something like that? And all of them were wrong and Elijah was right. Amen. And you can take that book and you can go out into this world and you can prophesy with the Word of God. Tell them what's going to happen. Go tell the world what's awaiting them. You know. You know what's awaiting them. You know what's coming down the pipe. They need to know that. They need to hear that. Well, Carl, me, Carl, we, me and Carl always notice that. I, when I got saved, I, you know, I think I've shared this too many times, but when I got saved, there was, we were in the Marine Corps, and there was four, one of us, one of them went home and got saved and come back with witness. And we would always make fun of him. And yep. we would leave, we'd all talk about, you know, we were under conviction. We'd all talk about how that makes a lot of sense. But we didn't want to admit it to him because that, that old nature has a bitterness against that. Yep. But, and I, I actually think, you know, because of Ephesians and other chapters, I actually think when a, when a person becomes reprobate, it doesn't no longer bother because they're past feeling. Yep. So I, to me, it's actually a good, I consider it a good thing when they do get bitter. I, I believe that that's a sign of conviction. Well, we believe that the word won't return void. Exactly. So if they get mad, guess what? Right. They're supposed to. Right. And it's actually a good thing right. to stir them up, right. to shake them. Exactly. It's, it's a good thing to shake them up. Right. That's what's not going on in your modern church. It's not shaking anybody up. They're keeping them complacent and comfortable where they're at in their sin. Exactly. I got some. One with God's the majority, like Elijah. Exactly. Else. Okay. Exactly. Amen. Yeah, that, that is, that's so true. That's so true. All right, Romans chapter 5. We're going to try to cover a few verses here, a number of verses. I'd like to finish this chapter, but it's probably not going to happen. And the reason I say that is because Verses 12 through 21 are all one thought. It's kind of like you have to take all of the verses into consideration to understand what, what Paul is teaching here to the Romans. So we'll, pr we'll try to read, at least read all the verses. I don't know if I'll comment on everything. There's just so much here. There's just too much here. But a couple of things we have here are two main characters. The two main characters in Verses 12 through 21 are Adam and Jesus. Adam and Jesus. Believe it or not, there are many similarities. Maybe next week we'll uh, run you through some of those similarities, and I'm sure there's some that I haven't even thought of. If I really get into it and study it, there are many similarities between Adam and Christ, and it even speaks of that here, and we'll read that in just a second. But what we, all, what we also have here is a cause and effect. Right? There's a cause and effect, and then also a problem and a solution. Amen? I like solutions. There's too many problems. You know, for most problems, there is a solution. Maybe not for all. Some are just past fixing. Sometimes things just can't be fixed. Amen? But for the most part, problems can be solved. Amen? If you're willing to take the steps necessary to solve that problem. Now the problem here is very evident. Look at verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world. Now we know who that man is, right? <laughs> That's Adam, right? Well, I thought Eve sinned. Well, Eve did sin and she was deceived, but guess what? He was her, her head. And the blame goes on leadership. You know, you see that with the ministry of Christ. You see these common people following Jesus gladly, right? But the leadership rejected him. And the leadership, the religious leader, turned the hearts of the common people against Christ. It's that leadership. Jesus was trying to win the leadership. You know how he did it? He was rough on them. He was tough on them. He called them hypocrites. He told them the truth. They didn't like to hear that. And they were very envious of him. So here the problem is very evident. So we have a problem, a solution, we have a cause and effect. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sin. So count them. Sin, sin, sin. Right there in one verse. That's the problem. Don't ever forget that. Amen? We're Bible believers. We, we use the word sin. We believe the book. We, we use the word sin. 
You ever notice if you're talking to someone, just talk to someone and talk to them, talk to them about murder, talk to them about extortion, talk to them about rape or something like that. And all of a sudden, they're, all they're fixated is upon things that are happening in this world. As soon as you say the word sin, instantly they're directed to the Bible or God or something beyond this world. As soon as you use that three-letter word, yes, sir. sin, yes. now they're thinking about God. Yep. When, you call, when you tell someone they're a sinner, that instantly draws their attention to a God, a higher power. Now, if you just deal with the sin, murder and such things like that, they don't even think about God often. That's why we need to use the word sin. Because the Bible uses that word. And that's the problem. Murder is sin. <laughs> that's what it is. We have to label it accordingly, correctly. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah. Shift. Exactly. Exactly. Blame it on something other than what, it, the, what the root of it is. You see, when you can identify the actual problem and the root of the problem, right, and then give them the solution, something can get done. It, you know, it doesn't seem like much is getting done in our country. Does it? I mean, 20 people dead just yesterday. Some crazy kid. Who knows how many drugs that guy's on? Who knows how many prescription drugs and everything else? Whacked out his brain. Lose their mind. Who would do such a thing? It's crazy. It's crazy. It's getting worse and worse and worse and worse, and it's going to continue that way. Sorry to be the bearer of bad news. It's not, man's not going to turn this thing around. Man is not going to turn this boat around. It's headed in one direction. Right? What's the Bible say? That all nations shall be turned into hell that forget God. Yes, sir. Well, that's where we're at. They don't want to hear about God, and they don't want to hear about sin, do they? They don't mind dealing with the symptoms of sin, the result of sin. Praise the Lord for a book that tells us the problem and gives us a solution and gives us the cause and the effect. So that's the problem. Look at verse 13. Now, there's some tricky stuff in here. You've got to really take your time and pay attention to the context, especially in the words many and all. Many trip up on this because they don't pay attention to the context. Verse 13, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. Now here when I told you that Jesus and Adam are, are very similar. Who is the figure of him that was to come. Jesus is, is the figure of Adam. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yep. So there's many similarities. Adam is a type of Christ. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll go through some of those things next week. Verse 15. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. See those words, many, many, many? Mm -hmm. Let's read verse 15 again. Let's kind of pick this thing apart, all right? But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. Do you see that? The free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, well, you can look at that many, and in, in, in the context in verse 12, it says, death passed upon all men. You know, everybody on earth, that's a lot of people. So sometimes when you think of many, it refers to everyone. But then often, other times, it doesn't refer to everyone. It just refers to a group of people. So you have to be real careful with the words all and many. Believe it or not, the Unitarian Universalists, which we have a church in town. They call themselves a church. I don't know. They're over on Jackson Street. They use this verse. This is a text that they use to prove that everyone will be saved one day. That includes Hitler. He's going to heaven. 
and Mussolini and Pol Pot and all the dictators and all the mafia and everyone, they're all going to have. That's the verse that they use. You know what they neglect? They neglect to understand the context because the context of those that receive the grace of God has to do with the free gift and receiving the free gift. We'll all be saved? Well, not according to Jesus. He said straight is the gate, straight is the, the way and and broad is the gate that leadeth unto destruction, and few there be that find it, right? Narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it, right? Many go in, right? The broad way. I mean, that's what Jesus said. Not everyone's going to receive the grace of God. Not everyone will receive the gift of the grace of God. But it says here that it has abounded unto many. It has abounded. That word abounded doesn't mean that Everyone will receive it. Could it be that it's available to all? Ah, maybe that's what it means. Look at Titus 2 and verse 11. Keep your place here. Titus 2, 11. I, I read through this quite a few times just trying to really grasp the alls and the manys in these verses because they can be a bit tricky. But if you understand the context, it definitely makes... A lot of sense. Titus 2 and verse 11. What's it say there? For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Have all men received the grace of God? Have all men received the gift by grace through Christ? Absolutely not. But it has abounded unto all. And it has appeared unto all. Now, you remember who preached on that verse? I remember, right here in this pulpit. Come on, Thane. Yeah. You do? Brother McLaughlin. Tony McLaughlin preached on that. Yeah. It's like the grace of God hath appeared unto all men. And he was like, I don't know how it did, but I just believe it. I just believe it. It hath appeared. Amen. God's grace hath appeared unto all men. You know, if a man wants the truth, God will get it to him. Exactly. God will get it to him. Yes, you know, if a man rejects the truth that's written on his heart, God will reject him. And how God does all this, I don't know. We just leave that into his hands. Right, right. You know, it's one of those things that the skeptic and the scoffer likes to bring. What about those that are never heard? Like, and here's an American, and there's Bibles everywhere, and you're trying to pass the buck off to some, you know, some uh, native in the jungle when you've heard it and you have the opportunity. Let God deal with that, amen? God will take that care of that. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? God's going to do right. You need to be concerned about you because <laughs> you have heard. It has abounded unto many. Romans 5 again. Let's turn back there. Look at verse 16. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. So again, it's, it's talking about this gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. That's upon all, right? Because all have sinned, right? Death is the effect Right? The cause and the effect. The problem is sin. The cause is sin. The effect is death. And what's the solution? Let me tell you what the solution is. It's the free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. That is the solution. Doesn't that solve the problem? Doesn't that solve the sin problem? Does that solve the death problem? Yep. It solves every problem, doesn't it? This is not a problem that salvation doesn't solve. It does. It takes care of it all. In eternity, it's solved. Amen? Amen? I like that. Verse 16, And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. Now, who would be justified? Those that receive the free gift, right? If you reject that gift, you're not justified before God, right? You will die in your sins because... Sin, death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. But God's giving the solution. You can be justified. 
you can be just and made right and innocent in the eyes of God, of God through the free gift. Verse 17, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive, you see that? Abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. John 1 and verse 12. If you want to put a cross-reference right next to verse 17, what does that mean to receive the grace of God? Because clearly that's the solution. It's receiving the free gift, which was given to man, which abounded unto man by the grace of God. We didn't deserve it. Man didn't deserve God's grace. Man does not deserve this gift, but it has been available, been made available and abounded unto all. John 1 and verse 12. You should know this verse. It, in one verse, it explains it all. For as many as, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. I'll tell you the one word I like in there, it's the word become. Right? Become. You know, I've been made a son of God by the power of God. He made me his son. He made me his child. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen? I've been made new. God did a work in me, and He completed it, and He finished it when I personally received the free gift of eternal life by what? By faith. Through believing, right? Look at Galatians chapter 3. Another verse here, good cross-reference. Galatians chapter 3. In verse 2, got my big Bible here, it's not as broke in. Galatians 3, in verse 2, This only what I learn of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? You can answer that question. They received the Spirit by the hearing of faith. Right? By faith alone. Look down in verse 14. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And then Ephesians chapter 2. You should be able to quote these. You should be able to quote Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9. Amen. Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace... That's what we're talking about there in Romans chapter 5, the gift of grace. For by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. All right, back to Romans chapter 5. Let's read verse 17 again. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace... Boy, that is an abundance of grace, isn't it? The free gift of eternal life. There's a lot in that, isn't there? Amen. And of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Is that an absolute truth? Is that a promise? So if you receive the free gift of eternal life by grace through faith, that you will reign in life. Why not take advantage of that thing now? Amen. You're going to reign with Jesus forever. Isn't that true? Yeah. Where I am, there will you be also right, and you'll never be separated, and you'll never be apart, and you'll always be together. You're going to reign with Him. Amen. 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 Well, we can, we can access some of that power right now to reign in life over death. There ought to be something about you, Christian, that's just different than all these folks that are just dying. There ought to be something about this. There should be some life about you. Amen? There should be, you should have a glow, amen? There should be something about you that's just like, man, they've got something I want. They have something that I'm looking for. 
They have something that I need. All these folks out there, they think they need this and they need that and they need this and they need that and they can't find it in anything in this world. And then they see a Christian that's just loving Jesus and loves the Word of God and reigning in life, right, over death, over this world, over all this stuff. And it's like, man, maybe that's what I need. Yeah, I, it is. <laughs> that's what you need. You need Jesus to fill that void. And it's a free, it's free. It is free, amen, to reign in life. Verse 18, Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. So again, you see this, right? You got to watch these alls and manys. It came upon. It's available, it's been manifest, right? It's abounded unto all men. There it is. The grace of God is for all. I don't know how the Calvinist gets around that stuff. Right? <laughs> right? All. If all have sinned, and that's everybody on planet Earth, and the grace of God and the gift of grace has abounded unto all, then it's available to all. Yes. But that doesn't mean that all will receive it. Right? Right? Because there's too many folks on planet Earth that are trying to earn it. Mm -hmm. You can't earn it. You receive it by faith, just as a free gift. You can't add to it. Right? The Catholics believe you've got to receive it, but then you've got to add to it. Of course. That just raises grace. Let's read verse 19 again. For as by one man's disobedience, that's Adam, many were made sinners. Well, that's everyone. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. If you keep that within the context, those that are made righteous are those that receive the free gift, and that's not everyone. Right? But it has abounded. You can't just pull one verse like the Unitarians just pull that verse out and say, and see, everyone ultimately one day is going to be saved. Right? Right there. One shall be made right, many shall be made righteous, right? Not if you keep that within the context and understand that that gift must be received by faith. And if you reject the gift of God, you reject, right, His righteousness. Romans chapter 10, good verse here. Romans chapter 10, I've used this quite often when dealing with religious folks. Romans 10 and verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. You know, it's a sad, sad deal, isn't it? When you got a religious person that has some zeal for God and has some zeal for their church and has some zeal for some real truth, right? But they're lacking in knowledge. There's something missing. Well, what's this, this knowledge that uh, they're missing here? For they being ignorant of God's righteousness. You know, if, if Sioux City is ignorant of God's righteousness, it's our fault. Yeah. Stop and think about it. If they don't know, how will they know unless someone tells them? Right? They don't know, do they? They're ignorant of God's righteousness. Well, what makes them so ignorant? And going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. They have not submitted themselves unto God's righteousness. And how do you receive God's righteousness? Not by works, right? Romans chapter 5, verse 20, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Look at Romans 7 and verse 13. Good cross-reference there to that first part where it says that the offense might abound. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. Romans 7 verse 13, Was then that which is good made death unto me, God forbid, but sin that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. 
See that word exceeding? That's very similar to abounding. That's what the law does. When that law enters in and the individual becomes aware of the law of God and they violated and transgressed and trespassed against God's law, the hope is that that sin would become exceedingly sinful and abound. They would see their lost condition and their need of a Savior. Right? That's the goal. The goal is to try to get the individual to see their need of a Savior. They must be lost. Romans chapter 5, look at verse 21 that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So what's the problem? That's it too, isn't it? It's not sin plus this, plus this, plus this, plus this, plus this. That'd be confusing, wouldn't it? God's not the author of confusion, so he just says, I don't know what the problem is. I'm going to tell you what the problem is. It's sin, and it always has been right. since day one. Right. What was the problem in the Garden of Eden? Sin. That was it. That's what brought about the... You know why everything dies? Trees die, grass dies, animals die, pews die, pulpits die. All this stuff's dying. These things aren't... They're not nearly as nice as they used to be. <laughs> everything is running down. The molecular structure in everything on planet Earth is running down. How do you explain that? How does the evolutionist explain that? I thought everything's running up. <laughs> we're getting better. I thought we're progressing. We're evolving, right? Isn't that a positive? No, we're devolving. <laughs> everything is running down. That's science. It's all running down. Yes, you know where it started? Genesis chapter 3. And that curse, that curse was passed. Right? Verse 12. By one man, that's Adam, sin entered into the world. You know what that tells us? A couple things. You know what that tells me? That before man fell, guess what? There was no sin in the world. No death, right? Nothing was running down. Actually, everything could have been running up. That's why you can't be an evolutionist and a Christian. What do they call those, those jokers? Uh, theistic evolutionists. I believe in God, and God used evolution to bring everything about, right? Well, you don't believe the Bible. I think... I can't remember there was a debate I saw. It's just... They're crazy. You know, they're trying to... The Catholic Church has adopted evolution. Well, yeah. They've adopted evolution. That's how everything came about. They're theistic evolutionists. That's the Catholic Church. What? Hugh Ross. Hugh Ross, yeah. The problem sin. And when Adam fell, sin entered into the world. So before the fall, the world... Think, think about this. The world, the creation was sinless. There was no curse on anything. Nothing was cursed. And then sin entered into the world. So there must have been sin outside of the world somewhere, right? Satan rebelled. Satan fell, right? And then you see that serpent entering into God's creation and tempting Eve, and then Adam partook, and man fell, and at that moment, guess what? Adam and Eve knew they were naked. Well, how'd they know that? They didn't know that before. And they didn't hide from God before either, right? And then in the very next chapter, Cain slew his brother, and Cain knew what he did was wrong, right? Sin entered into the world. Where did it enter into? It entered into the heart of man. That's the place. That's the place. Sin entered into the world. It came from outside of the world and entered in through temptation, through subtlety. 
And when man disobeyed, you know what that thing did? It altered all of the creation. Everything. You know what that tell me? That tell me that God doesn't take sin too lightly. That's why the Bible over and over again addresses sin. It addresses sin. It talks about sin and sin. That is the problem. Just about every trouble in your life can be traced to sin. I'm not saying ever. And some things that just like come out of the blue and it's like that just happen. Because time and chance happen to us all. But for the most part, guess what it is? And it needs to be, you need to, you need to recognize that in your own heart and your own life. That this problem is the result of sin and I need to do business with the Lord and I need to deal with this thing because God can heal you. He can heal you. He can give you the victory over it. So along with sin enter the consequences of sin, cause and effect. The effect is death by sin and death passed upon all men for that all have sin. And along with death, look at verse 18, judgment and condemnation. Boy, there's some nice positive words, amen? <laughs> I, I'm not worried about it. The only thing I'm concerned with is the judgment seat of Christ and what I did for Him and my works and what sort they were and what my motive was and how faithful I was to what He's called me to do. There's my concern. I'm not concerned with the great white throne judgment. My name's in the book, amen? <laughs> My name's in the book. The I'm saved and sealed. Amen. But I'm still going to be judged. So I want to maintain some good works for His glory and for His honor. I want the world to see Christ through me and through this church. I want them to see Jesus, not Lighthouse, not Tim. <laughs> Christ. And that's a heart matter, isn't it? Now, there's something interesting here. Verse, what is it? Verse 14. Nevertheless, verse 13, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. It almost seems like a contradiction. Read it again. Look at it. For until the law, sin was in the world. So from Adam to Moses, sin was in the world, right? But then it says... But sin is not imputed where there is no law. So how could there be death and sin in the world if there was no law? Well, the thing is, there was a law. It wasn't a written law. It wasn't in a book. But there was a law. It's called the knowledge of sin. You see, when they partook of the tree of the knowledge of what? Good and evil, right? Right? At that moment, they became aware. Their conscience was now awakened. They received that knowledge. And guess what? You're accountable to what you know. Exactly. Yep. I got a question. Sure. You know about sin that can cause um, anarchy? That's why we have law and order in our society. Of course. That's why we need law enforcement. And we ought to support our law enforcement. <laughs> what if they all went home and just went on strike? You better get your guns ready. Yes, sir. <laughs> you better be prepared. Thank God for law enforcement. All right, we're going to stop there. We'll, we'll pick it back up here in verse 13 and 14. I've got a lot more I want to say on these verses. There's just so much here. It's, yes, you know, it's such a blessing. Yes, I thank God. I thank God for the solution. Right, amen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's it. And I thank God it's free. Yes, sir. What well, the best solution ever? You ain't got to pay for it, right? You know, like these these uh, these financial gurus. You know, we've got the answer to all your problems. It'll only cost you, <laughs> right? It'll only cost you so much for the seminar and the tapes and the DVDs and you know. And here's a solution to all of man's problems because sin's the problem, and it's free, and man don't want it, and the religious folks don't want it. They want to earn it. What a sad, sad deal, amen. All right, let's take a break.